And it's important to say that I'm not the first person to address the Cardiff uh, Business Club. Almost 90 years ago, on November 27th, 1924, a Barclays director, Sir William Carruthers, delivered a lecture to your club entitled Responsibility. So Sir William started his banking career with the British Linen Bank before joining London and Provincial in 1881. In 1981, shortly, sorry, in 1918, <laughs> in 1918, shortly after the Great War, he became the Deputy General Manager. And on the merger with Barclays, he was appointed General Manager in those days. That was really the term for the Chief Executive. He held this position until his retirement in 1923 and was elected to the board in 1920. I managed to find a copy of what Sir William said, and I was struck by how much is relevant today. Among many other things, he spoke of the responsibility of everyone, government, business, civil society, following the Great War to protect liberties, tackle growing unemployment, contribute to economic growth, specifically through greater support for British trade in foreign markets, and invest in the education and training of future generations. So there's a certain familiar ring to some of these issues. Um, but the context of Sir William's speech was rather different. He talked about the importance of Britain's financial institutions in financing a war of unprecedented dimensions. And the fact that Britain had passed through the industrial crisis, not just without a hint of financial collapse, but with our reputation as the world's financial centre, strengthened and enhanced. Sir William put this down in large part to the unshaken confidence in our financial integrity, and I will return to this shortly. Now, it's quite tempting for me to just deliver Sir William's speech this evening, um, but you'll be pleased to know that I decided not to, uh, he spoke for an hour and a quarter, <laughs> and I intend to speak only for 20 minutes. But what I will do is stick to the essence of what Sir William spoke about, responsibility. Specifically, the responsibility that falls on all of us to tackle the profound challenges that the world faces today. Sir William delivered his speech shortly after the end of the First World War, a conflict that saw nine million people killed and one that had serious consequences for the global economy in the ensuing years. It serves as a reminder that great though the challenges we face today are, previous generations have overcome far greater ones. And just as our great-grandparents recovered from unparalleled global conflict and economic hardship, so it is all of our responsibility to meet the challenges of the economic crisis, global warming, generational unemployment, and international development head on. Because I believe failure to do so will have devastating consequences for our children and their children. For Barclays, the past few years have been some of the most challenging, but also some of the most important in our 320 year history. The events of the recent past have been well documented. I don't propose to go through them again but suffice it to say the financial sector collectively lost its way. We and others lost sight of our role in society and the people we exist to serve. Banks were too aggressive, too self-serving, too short-term focused. <coughs> and the impact of those mistakes is still being felt around the world. But what I'm interested in now is that we take responsibility for putting things right. Wherever we live, whatever our background, people share the same fundamental ambitions. Since becoming chief executive last year, I've travelled extensively to visit Barclays' key markets and clients around the world. And this simple truth has been repeatedly borne home to me. For example, in May of this year, I was in Kenya. We have a very large business there. And I was visiting one of the large slums, Makuru. I sat with a young man, no more than 20, in his home, which was a space 10 by 10. And I asked him, what do you want? What do you want from life? And I sort of expected him to say, you know, a flat screen television or a car. He said, I want to be somebody that people can count on. 
He was also an Arsenal fan, and he wanted Arsenal to win the Premier <laughs> League. But his simple, his simple wish as a human being was to be somebody that somebody could count on. And he spoke with equal passion about Arsenal, but about the recent constitution that had been implemented in Kenya and its effect on making the lives of the people of Kenya better. So when you get down to it and strip away all the noise, we're simple creatures. People want good health, peace and security, increased prosperity, and better opportunities for themselves and their families. That was true when Sir William stood before your club. And as we know, what, driven, what delivers these ambitions in the long term, democracy, effective government, the rule of law, respect for human rights, and of course, <laughs> capitalism. Now you may not have expected me to talk about capitalism. In many ways, it's become a byword for what's unacceptable about business. And if one thing was made clear by the excesses leading up to the financial crash, it was the destruction that can be caused by capitalism without a moral compass, lacking the control and responsibility that can make it a force for good. But we need to work if we are to tackle the immense challenges before us. For a while, for a while I accept that capitalism is far from perfect. No one has yet found a better way of driving prosperity and new opportunity. It was capitalism, together with international co cooperation, that ultimately drove the global economic recovery after both world wars. And it is capitalism that has left every generation since then better off than the previous one. In addition to lifting hundreds of millions of people out of poverty in Asia, parts of Latin America, and Africa, we need a capitalism that works in the right way for everyone in society. So what does that mean for Barclays and for banking? As I mentioned earlier in the six years following the First World War, our country's banks saw their reputation grow in the eyes of the outside world. Banks recognized their responsibility in rebuilding a nation. But Civilium also knew the importance of not standing still, of maintaining integrity while being progressive and building upon the conf confidence that had grown over many years. A confidence, he said, that, and I'm quoting, will continue so long as our guiding principle is a sense of responsibility for the maintenance of sound financial conditions. I stand here six years on from the start of the financial crisis. Six years that have seen public trust and confidence in our industry sink to an all-time low. Much has already changed for the better. We are arguably in the middle of the most radical global transformation of banking regulation ever seen. Banks have safer balance sheets, better risk management, and improved governance and supervision. But we have to go much further than this if we're to restore public trust in our institution and our industry. My absolute conviction is there can be no choice between doing well financially and behaving responsibly in business. The last few years made it obvious that you cannot have long-term success without behaving responsibly. This has to be integral in the way that you operate as a company. The mistakes of the past have been very costly, and I am determined that everyone at every level of Barclays must be responsible for ensuring they cannot be repeated. As Sir William put it, responsibility differs in degree, but not in essence. Each one is under some obligation, and to the extent to which he or she falls short, the whole community must suffer. Well put, I think. For me, achieving this collective responsibility starts with having a common purpose and values that serve as a foundation for everything that we want to achieve. In January of this year, we launched at Barclays our goal of becoming the go-to bank, the bank where you, our customers and clients, naturally go to do business because we serve you best. Our purpose of helping people achieve their ambitions in the right way this is all about this sense of people, of humanity, of who we are, 
of how we're all connected on this planet. We breathe the same air, drink the same water. And of course, our values of respect, integrity, service, excellence, and stewardship. Inevitably, cynics have suggested that this might be a PR exercise. It isn't. Let me tell you that I have no tolerance for an employee at Barclays who is unwilling to adopt our core values. I have made this absolutely clear. If they are unable to change, then they should leave the bank, no matter how senior or how good a job they're doing. One of our Quaker founders, John Freen, believed that the bank was a moral endeavor, holding money for customers on trust. I want Barclays to reconnect with this ethos, and I believe we will succeed, not least because, overwhelmingly, the people I work with in Barclays and across banking want to do the right thing. That spirit is why my colleagues are engaging so positively with the program of change that we're implementing. I recognize that what matters is not public commitment to change, but rather demonstrating how change over a sustained period can be delivered. We have to earn the trust and permission to be believed, and we will. Banks are often referred to as the engine of the economy, but businesses, the corporations that you lead and serve, are the life and blood. <coughs> Your role in helping drive sustainable economic recovery is arguably more critical today than it's ever been. And our responsibility is to be an efficient enabler and valuable partner to you. Our customers are beginning to show greater confidence in the state of the market. Across the economy as a whole, the proportion of businesses feeling positive about the current health of the economy is now 43%, nearly double what it was last year. It also means that the number of businesses feeling optimistic is now greater than those feeling negative. So for the first time in several years, business leaders, the people in this room, making decisions as to where to expand, take responsible risks and hire new staff, are feeling positive about the future. And it's not just in London. Across the United Kingdom, the numbers are suggesting that the economy is gradually moving in the right direction. Our own customers are seeing 6% more cash flow through their accounts than at the same point last year. Here in Cardiff in the second quarter of 2013, turnover from small businesses increased by 7% from the same period in 2012. This is double the national average, so well done to everybody here in Cardiff. The number of startups has also increased by 3%, and job creation has proved resilient. <clears throat> but domestic and international headwinds to recovery remain. There is a long way to go and a huge amount to be done on tax, on regulation, on access to finance, even on business skills. If we we're to achieve growth anywhere near the levels that we saw pre-crisis, and I personally believe um, that we are entering a period of structurally lower economic growth, and we can talk a bit about why I believe that in the Q&A, and I think that has some <laughs> profound implications for organisations, not just within business, but in government and civil society also. Barclays has a big role to play in helping economic recovery. Now, I could stand here and reel off a whole bunch of facts and figures about what we do for the real economy. But the challenge I would like to briefly cover is how we can support those companies of all sizes with real growth potential and ambition, in particular businesses that are looking to export. Now, half a, new, half a million new businesses are founded every year, yet the total never really changes. Why? It's easy to look at the fact that this pool of businesses stayed stable through tough times and see that as being a good thing, which of course it is. But such a high turnover of new businesses with no growth in overall numbers could mean a significantly saturated market. <coughs> this week we're publishing some research which shows that the average UK business hits a domestic growth ceiling after four years, where they can no longer drive 
their desired growth from UK markets alone. The UK economy is deeply innovative, with much of that innovation coming from our smaller businesses, but it's also extremely competitive. And the domestic market will not be large enough to sustain continued growth in the size or number of businesses in a meaningful way. We are, after all, a small island. Will a manufacturer in Cardiff be happy to limit itself to Glamorgan for all its customers? Not in my experience. The solution has to be found in reaching new customers overseas. Building an effective export market is too important a challenge to be abandoned as the economy recovers. As Sir William put it back in 1924, we, as a nation, are, in the long run, dependent upon our ability to trade abroad. He saw the challenges all those years ago and thought it was a question of excess modesty. What a novelty in today's age. He said, we need a much better organisation of British trade in foreign markets, a much more systematic training of foreign travellers, and a greater readiness to consider the requirements or even the prejudices of our customers overseas. I agree. That is why Barclays has developed a package of services to help businesses get ready to export. We help customers manage international credit checks, export documentation preparation, international currency. Equally important are the workshops we organise to help businesses approach exporting with confidence. I also believe that we can work more effectively with government. We need to be better at the high-profile, highly organised trade delegations, which countries like the United States do so well. And businesses, of course, need to be willing to take risks. Half the exporters in our research said they wish they had started sooner. And half of them said that the main barriers were psychological. I can promise you that if one of our customers wants to take the plunge, we'll be with them every step of the way. That's our responsibility. It's also our responsibility to weigh up the impact of our activity and decisions on communities and societies. This means looking long term, not just over a six month period. It means actively thinking about the needs of all of our stakeholders, not just in terms of mitigating negative impacts, but thinking about ways of operating that have positive societal benefits. Let me give you an example. One million young people in this country alone are not employed pursuing education or in vocational training. Three quarters of these do not think they can achieve their ambitions. The scale of the structural change over the last 20 years has radically altered the employment landscape and caused a generation of people to believe they cannot succeed. But young people are our future. They're our future workforce, entrepreneurs, a source of productivity, and society needs them to succeed. The economic loss from disengaged young people in Europe alone is in excess of $150 billion, more than 1% of GDP. Failure to, failure to support them not only impacts on our economic prosperity today, it threatens our well-being tomorrow. The global population, particularly in mature economies, is expanding and living longer. And the costs associated with this demographic shift are rising quickly and materially. But those most able to make a difference in addressing the issues that the world faces from this intergenerational transfer, the people I refer to, are often denied a chance to do so. This is unacceptable. It's not OK that a million young people in this country have no hope. We have to unlock talent and innovation in the next generation if we're to secure our own economic future. And this issue is not new. Sir William spoke to the, this club at length about the problems of unemployment nearly a century ago, of a generation of young men who had returned from combat to nothing. And he recognised that governments could only do so much. He said, government schemes for the direct relief of unemployment can at best be palliatives, 
and the great responsibility which rests upon us, both as individuals and as a nation, is to discover some means by which relief of unemployment may become less necessary because the volume of unemployment has diminished. That could have been written for today. For Barclay's part, we realise that young people need help to develop the necessary skills and knowledge to be successful, not just in business, but in life. That's why we've launched a programme which we call Five Million Young Futures, designed to impact the life of five million young people around the world by 2015. This includes our flagship apprenticeship program, where we've hired a thousand apprentices, mostly from the neat population, 80% of whom were on benefits before they came to us, and we'll hire another thousand by the end of 2015. We have literally changed these people's lives because we've given the opportunity and they've seized that opportunity. When you talk to these young people, it's inspirational. These are people who had no hope, no hope at all, who would describe the despair of sitting at home day after day, sending off resumes, filling out internet applications and getting nowhere, of feeling like life had given up on them. And when you talk to these young people about the transformational effect of the opportunity that we and other organisations have given them, the power that it does for them as individuals, for their self-confidence, their ability to have an impact in the economy, and the broader effect on their family and friends and the societies where they do business, this is proof of the power of addressing this problem. And it is a great credit to my colleagues at Barclays that they have established and run this scheme with many partners to make it happen. There are other good companies doing great work in this area also. Um, McDonald's and Centrica come to mind, BT. But this is where business can have a real impact and has a responsibility to have an impact, a moral responsibility, an ethical responsibility, of course, but also a pragmatic responsibility because people in employment are economically active. They contribute to society don't take resources from society. They buy goods and services. They're customers. This is a good thing all round. Another flagship program for us is our life skills program. Again, a Barclays program, which we've established in partnership with many other companies. Over 4,000 teachers have registered with this program, over 1,500 schools around the country, to deliver programs in schools which help young people Think about starting a business. Understand how to go to an interview, how to write a CV, how to uh, provide a, produce a plan for their lives to fulfill their aspirations and their potential. And this is very, very important work. Uh, and I am very proud of the difference that we at Barclays are making in the lives of young people. It is our responsibility to do so and uh, I think we are just getting started on this. As I say, our goal is to influence five million young people around the world. There are lots of reasons why we are in the situation we're in. It is not unique to the UK. It's common in other developed countries, South Africa, Western Europe, the United States. It is fundamentally a product of the change in the nature of work. You cannot leave school today as you could 30 years ago, and get a job without any basic level of literacy and numeracy and any interpersonal skills. I was talking to a politician earlier today whose constituency is in the north of England about this very topic, and he said to me, yes, 30 years ago, people would leave school and go into the mines. Uh, it's a huge industry, or was a huge industry here in Wales. Those jobs don't exist anymore. If you want to work in McDonald's, if you want to work in Barclays, if you want to work in Sainsbury's, you have to have basic levels of literacy and numeracy, and you have to have enough social skills and enough confidence to be able to interact with customers. And the educational system hasn't deliberately failed these young people, but it hasn't caught up with the shift in the nature of work. And we cannot just expect government, as my predecessor said, to take up the strain here. We in business have to do that, not only because it's the right thing to do, but because it's in our commercial interests to do so. And it's one of the things that I am 
proudest of at my time at Barclays, and I'm very proud of my colleagues and how they've rallied around this initiative. Finally, um, given my work with the Prince of Wales on banking environment initiatives, I don't want to leave without mentioning the importance of the environment to Barclays. We know that a business of our size and scale has the potential to have a positive impact in the world, not least by managing the environmental footprint of our operations and infrastructure, but also financing the environmental economy by providing solutions across our businesses and geographies, and managing environmental risks in our lending activities. We're making good progress in this, including the Carbon Disclosures Project, FTSE Leadership Indices, and the top 10 of Bloomberg's world's greenest banks. We have implemented a number of energy savings initiatives, such as the introduction of low energy lighting in retail branches in the UK. And the Banking Environment Initiative, where I chair the CEO panel, works with corporate customers in the direction of capital towards environmentally and socially, economic, uh, socially sustainable economic activity. Managing environmental issues is not only a reputation enhancing activity, it makes good business sense, offering new opportunities and improving risk management. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the Prince of Wales for his unswerving commitment to this initiative. In closing, I want to thank Sir William Carruthers for his speech all those years ago. Not only did it give me food for thought in preparing my own remarks, but it really emphasised to me that the, cha the challenges we face today have been overcome by previous generations. I appreciate that this has been somewhat of a whirlwind tour of uh, the challenges, but I hope that I've given you a sense of how, under my leadership, we're addressing these challenges at Barclays. In essence, if you look at where things have gone wrong in the last six years, it was a product of an excessive focus on short-term, narrowly defined goals. The problems that we face in the world today are all long-term problems. I talked about youth unemployment. I talked about climate change. I mentioned structural changes to the global economy, demographics. These are all very long-term problems that require long-term thinking and long-term solutions to them. Leaders of enterprises and other organizations, such as myself, have an obligation to consider the short and the long-term consequences of their actions and to define success for all stakeholders, not just short-term profitability for shareholders. When I talk to shareholders, shareholders understand this. They recognize that they want to invest in a company that is going to grow and be sustainable over time. If we think about the history of the world from, say, the late 70s to 2008, I suspect we will come back to look at this as something of a golden era. Some would argue that it's a fool's golden era. But it's a golden era in which prosperity rose around the world. We saw increasing democracy and the rule of law. We had global economic growth from 2000 to 2007 of over 5%. And that allowed individuals, companies, governments, to do more. And we all like doing more. We feel good when we do more as human beings. We're now entering an era which I regard as being a sort of bronze era, an era where things won't be terrible, but the ability just to have more and do more has gone away. And so the fundamental challenge for the societies of the world and for their institutions is basically how to do more with less. That's true if you're in the civil service in the UK, if you're running the health service, if you're running Barclays, and I suspect in many of your businesses too. But I am optimistic about the future because I think the pressure 
of having to do more with less. We'll create a more sustainable version of economic growth, which will ultimately benefit the people of the world. And I am proud that Barclays has a role to play in that. Thank you very much.